pranams to Sadhguru Ma, pranams to Swamiji, and uh, my deepest gratitude and pranams to the chair of this session, Professor Bhatt, who is a living legend for all of us in the uh, in Indian philosophy. And we have followed him and uh, been together in many conferences over the last several decades. So it's really an honor and a privilege for me to have you as the chair of this session. Thank you, sir. Uh, my uh, deepest reverence also to all the great scholars who are here and to the, I would say, extremely inspiring family of Sadhguru Ma and uh, for my repeated opportunity to come here. I came here to deliver a talk a couple of years ago. Uh, I think it was uh, Sri Patabi Memorial Lecture on uh, Swami Vivekananda. So I want to take, a, uh, take my cue from what uh, Professor Godavari Mishra said. We have all been enjoying the Daivi Sampar here over the last two days. And I see this as a defining feature of the kind of conferences that the Sri Vishnu Mohan Foundation has been organizing. Apparently, this is the 50th conference of this kind. So let us give Swamiji a big hand. Uh, but more importantly, let us also spend a few moments to plan how to take this great yajna forward with your permission. Now, I also want to acknowledge uh, uh, Sri uh, Vithal Narkarniji and his neighbor, and we've been having these wonderful conversations. So I'm taking a cue from one of these conversa conversations, sir, and normally we begin with a Sanskrit shloka, but I want to begin with an abhanga from Tukara. Uh, he says, uh, Adhi Hota Tattanga. Adhi Hota Tattanga. Tuka Thala Pandurang. Pyatte Bhajan Rahina. Mula Swabhava Daina. So I will now translate, which is actually linked to our team. Karya and Akarya. So he says earlier, it was satsang, like where we are today. We come here for satsang. Then he says, Tukara, that is Tukara, Tukara Dhala Panduram. Tukara became Panduram, like Ahamdam Bhaskar. Then he says, but Pyate Bhajan Rahina. In spite of that, his Bhajan, his singing of the Lord's name, has not stopped. Then he explains why. So he says, Mura Svabhav Dain. So his Svabhava does not change. So I think that uh, this explains in a nutshell the mystery of Karya and Akarya. That which is to be done continues prior to, during, and even after the realization of Brahma Vidya, it would seem. And uh, I think once again, this is something for us to reflect upon about how to go from here. Now, uh, what I normally do when I go to a conference and give a paper is try to give a gist in a sentence or two about what I'm trying to say. Because as I grow older, I find that my own attention span has decreased. And unless yesterday, uh, Mr. Rajiv Balakrishnan was also saying that you have to be able to say everything in about two or three minutes because if you can't, you've lost your audience. So, oh, the gist of what I want to say in terms of my own uh, thinking about this really complex topic, I'm going to say that right at the beginning. And of course, I'm taking my cue from the Bhagavad Gita, whom uh, you know, every single speaker here has referred to. Okay. Which is simply this, action cannot be renounced, okay? Action cannot be renounced, but the sense of doership should be renounced. But here's a little trick, catch, because even doership cannot be renounced. The act of renunciation binds us back 
into the chain of action. So doership should be recognized as an illusion. So action cannot be renounced, but doership should be recognized as an illusion. Now, Sri Krishna himself says this in the Bhagavad Gita, and I'm going to come to that in a moment. But the real point is that most speakers here have spoken about action and have tried to understand the dynamics of action, ethical action, also from a Western perspective, deontology, communicative action. But very few have focused on the doer, on the agent of the action. And I think the great contribution of our tradition is to dissolve or, or take us to the point where the doer of the action can be dissolved. I think this is the great contribution of our tradition. Arshka Vidya, he doesn't like my saying Sanatana Dharma. Because in all the other traditions, as far as I understand them, even in the Western tradition, and here I want to refer to Dr. Panira Selvam's engagement with the West and its philosophical tradition, which is also important. I'm going to come to that. You're not able to get out of that agency, individuality. You're still trapped in the cycle of individuality. And I think that uh, the wonderful thing about our tradition, now, uh, you know, Vedanta, is that it can take us to the point where we see that uh, doership is an illusion. And we can ask a subsidiary question, then why ahamkar? Because everyone has ahamkar, right? The identification of ourselves with this body, mind, or whatever other layers are, this entity. Of course, ahamkara has a practical use and utility. For one, it helps us maintain the body, you know, so we can see the utility of Ahamkara, but not its ultimacy, not its ultimate truth. It has no ultimate truth to give us. It has a utility, a practical utility. To that extent, that Ahamkara can be maintained. After a point, even that becomes impossible, but we leave it at that for the time being. Uh, and I want to come back to the point I began with which is what makes this uh, garland of uh, the Shrinkhala, this garland of conferences so important and, and in some sense so vital to the bigger task of national regeneration. And I think that it is the presence of Swamiji in all the sessions. I bumped the morning session, bumped in the sense that I had something to do, but I was listening to all of you on uh, uh, a zoo whenever possible, but he has been there throughout. So the presence of a realized person is what makes a fundamental difference between the so-called secular conferences, which hundreds of them we have attended, academic conferences, they are merely cerebral exercises, you know. It's all gymnastics of the mind. What is different here is that there is the basis of Anubhava, and in fact, I'm now coming to the point where without Anubhava, we should not even speak as academics. We may need to because we have to earn a living, we have to build our CV, and we have to uh, get promotions, and we, you know, feed the numbers in our annual reports. But that is not the purpose of, uh, of Indian knowledge traditions. The purpose is to realize ourselves and also then Abhyudaya, right? Shreyas and Abhyudaya. How do we serve uh, society? So I think that what makes this conference chain or this conference, uh, you might say, series different is the presence of Swamiji, the presence of learned people, but Anubhava, which is the basis even of the Veda, because the Vichar comes after the Anubhava, isn't it? Anubhava is the foundation. And then some Achara, it has to translate into into benefit, you know, and and here we we must go back to the fundamental premise, I think, of uh, our tradition, which is that we are already Brahman. We are already the self. It cannot be brought from outside, and everybody in this room is sure to be enlightened 
if they are not already enlightened. And I mean, moksha, mukti, kaivalya, each one of us, this is a promise, it's already ours. Okay? What remains is, in a way, the removal of ignorance. And ignorance is nothing but false identification, right? That's why I'm saying focusing on the doer is more important than focusing on the action. Who is it that is doing the action? Supposedly doing the action. And here, I mean, Krishna says it very clearly uh, in the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, first he says in chapter 3, verse 4, that one cannot achieve freedom from karmic action and reaction by merely abstaining from one. This has been quoted earlier. Nor can one attain perfection of knowledge by physical renunciation. He says it very clearly. So you can't stop acting, you know, because the gunas themselves, your pravrittis, everything will force you to act. And, uh, uh, you know, like in the morning, try to tell yourself, I will not get out of bed. It is very difficult. After a while, you want to get up. So something is pushing you out of bed. So tamas is very important because it lets you sleep. But then Rajas and Sattva and other things are forcing you out. So you can't stop acting. But then what does uh, Bhagavan say? What does Sri Krishna say? He says that nobody, uh, this is uh, chapter 3 verse 5, nobody can remain without action even for one moment. Indeed, all beings are compelled to act by their qualities born of material nature. The three good acts. So none of us can escape from that. But then what is the answer? The answer is in 327. He says, all activities are carried out by the three modes of material nature, but in ignorance, the soul, deluded by false identification with the body, thinks of itself as the doer. So he says very clearly, ahankara vimura atma. Aham iti manyati. Aham iti manyati. It's so beautiful. It's all stated clearly. So this vimura atma, through ignorance and false identification, undergoes this chain of birth, rebirth, suffering, and so forth. And that is all that needs to be done, as it were, if anything has to be done at all. But things have to be done, as I said earlier. And Swamiji said, let's, let's reflect on how to take this forward. So I want to focus on, uh, just for a few moments, on what I consider to be really the important achievements of this conference. So the first, I've already mentioned, the presence of uh, a person such as Swamiji directing this endeavor and guiding all of us and taking it to a view there. So I've already mentioned this, no need to repeat it. The second important thing, as I see it, is this so-called, I call it so-called, uh, advisedly because I'm going to explain what I mean by it, the so-called interfaith anger. Now, this is a very important thing. We saw in the beginning, in the very first session, okay, we had, uh, uh, you know, Arif Muhammad Khan Saab speak, and he spoke so well. We were all witness to that. Such a learned presentation he gave, quoting from the Mahabharata and the Shastras. It was highly inspiring. And the, uh, the Consul General of the United States, Judith Ravin, she represents the Abrahamic tradition, and perhaps she's Jewish for that. She's, she spoke very well as, you know, too. And of course, uh, the Consul General from Thailand representing the Theravada Buddhist tradition. We've had a number of scholars here uh, who are Muslim, uh, Janat Sahab, who just left. Now, this for me is really important because we have a tendency nowadays to be very aggressive in this Hindutva push, which is also important. I'm not trying to say that Hindutva is not important, but aggression is not always the best way forward. And uh, we have to find other, other means and ways to include everybody. And we see that there's a great interest in our traditions, you know, uh, and all these traditions, the Arshtar traditions that uh, uh, Professor Mishra spoke about, and a meaningful dialogue is really important, isn't it? So when, uh, when uh, Ms. Judith Ravan said that she 
talked about religious pluralism, religious tolerance, the freedom to practice religion. I also wanted to tell her that we must also respect the freedom, the freedom not to be proselytized. That is also my human right. It is your human right to practice your religion, but my it is my human right. See, when you have a telephone and people keep bothering you, you say, do not disturb. So we should have a right to say, please do not disturb. When I need you, when I want something from you, I want to learn about your tradition, I'll invite you. But this, uh, this tremendous money, energy, and political uh, backing for proselytizing in the name of freedom of expression, is I, think, uh, is, I think, an error in the understanding of what religious freedom and pluralism means. So I think a forum like this, a forum like this, can give us that opportunity for a meaningful dialogue. And here is when I want to uh, refer to something that was asked earlier by my younger friend. We have always looked at interfaith. That's why I said so-called interfaith. In terms of similarities, Aham Brahmasmi Anhal Haq. Karya, akarya, or karya, uh, or karma, vikarma, akarma. I thought you would talk about Vinoba, sir. I'm going to come to that. There was no time. But we say, okay, haram and halal. We always think, try, we always try to think or say that all traditions are similar, essentially, but they're not. So there's a better way to do interfaith dialogue by talking about differences and incommensurable. There are some incommensurables. So when you say that the, the individual is entirely different from the divine and can never be the divine, that is an incommensurable in philosophical terms with Advaita with Aham Brahmasmi. So there's no point trying to collapse the difference. We should simply say we respect these differences. But please, for us, it is halal to say somebody is a kafir and then what the right hand gets, what to do with the things you've conquered with the right hand, what you've conquered with the left hand, what in Hindi we call ganima. So the history of desecration, vandalism, that is so what I'm trying to say to us, what I'm trying to say is there is a very positive way of doing this interfaith, which I think when we move forward, rather than being aggressive in Dutravadi, as some of us try to be, uh, it is better to have an inclusive dialogue with an understanding of the differences a respect for differences, and also drawing the line that what is not acceptable to us as a Hindu, as a Sanatani, a certain kind of proselytization is not acceptable to me. And uh, it is in my interest and in the interest of my community, and also in the interest of the nation in my view, to have certain safeguards to protect people from this aggressive proselytization. And we don't want these very big powers to tell us constantly, poking us through their media and other channels that look, allow this, you know, change your FCRA so that we can pour in money and, and do this. Uh, and similarly, the aggression that comes uh, from certain Abrahamic uh, communities when they want to impose uh, whatever jihads we are talking about. Uh, which uh, I don't want to bring in these matters, but I don't think what I'm simply saying, I don't think a meaningful interfaith uh, dialogue can happen without also addressing these. We can't simply put them aside and say, oh, we have to be really polite. We only talk about uh, dharma and ahimsa. No, we have to also address some hard questions. But I think that we have seen in this conference that this can be done very meaningfully, very peacefully, and in a manner that we can mutually understand and learn both similarities and differences. That's my point, okay? So this is my second point. Now my third point, Swamiji, is how to take this forward. And my humble suggestion is that we should uh, now possibly do the next conference on a topic such as 
uh, we've done, you know, karya and akarya. Now we can do something like karma, karya, and kartavya. Something like this. What I suggest Oh, that is wonderful. So because, so yeah, kartavya because we are talking about how Rajpath has become kartavya part. <laughs> And uh, so, what is the kartavya? What is the duty that is now required of us as a resurgent nation after, you know, so many years of being uh, in a very difficult state, as we know? And how can we all contribute to that? So, I think that this we should move forward in this series uh, with, with a topic like what Professor Bhatt has suggested. And I think that... Uh, this is a wonderful venue. You can't have a better venue than this. But perhaps we can go to another part of the country and look for a local partner, like a local university, look for support from ICPR. If I had been director of IIS, I would have right away here itself announced that the next conference we will host at IIS. But unfortunately, that's not to be. Asiatic Society. Asiatic Society. So, yeah. You so this is a very good venue. So we need colla collaboration. We need uh, collaborators, and other universities can also collaborate, and we can take this forward. But as long as you're present, and as long as there's a small committee with people like uh, Professor Bhatt and others, so that the direction is given and it doesn't become a mere academic exercise. It should be more meaningful than a mere academic exercise. So that was my submission. <laughs> now, uh, I want to refer to, uh, and now this is the second part of my paper. The first part I've already uh, you know, finished, which is what to do from here. Uh, the second part is uh, going back to the original theme and uh, some of my uh, few reflections. And here I want to bring in just as we are uh, talking about not just action, but doership in all these different traditions, we've had uh, wonderful, I think, papers on Mimamsa uh, and the injunctive versus just the statements, descriptive, injunctive versus descriptive, right? So within the broader uh, traditions uh, of Sanatana Dharma, we need to as it would, we've had some discussions, but we can possibly take this forward. For example, uh, you talked about uh, Professor Mishra, how Shankara is always trying to cut Sankhya, isn't it? You just mentioned that, but a Satkaryavad is also something that we can reflect on. Nobody here has talked about it. I'm not a professional philosopher. I'm a curious person. <laughs> and I try to read and write a little bit. But, join your club. <laughs> but Satkaryavad, is also a way to show us that if the effect is already inherent in the cause, and if the first cause is Brahman, then everything that follows can be nothing other than Brahman. So there is nothing other than Brahman. So all actions, whether... Exactly. That's it. So, so I'm saying this is one direction to explore uh, this topic in my view. That was one submission I wanted to make. But the other thing I wanted to also talk about very briefly, since time is limited, is how do we engage with the very robust uh, tradition of Western philosophy, which we can't simply ignore. And those of us who are in the university are still in the process of decolonizing. We haven't been fully decolonized. Yeah. And I think that uh, Professor Paneer Selman has shown us some links and paths and ways to approach this problem. And I wanted to very briefly dwell on that. So when we look at this move, you talked about the linguistic turn is already being present in India. And it was not new. It's there in Nagarjuna, it's there in Dignar. So we've had the linguistic turn for a very long time, without question. But I think what's very important is in the last, uh, let's say, century or half a century, for 75 years, the idea of the sovereign subject, the Kantian idea of the sovereign subject has really got eroded. First of all, Freud tells you that you're not a rational agent. Your desires and your unconscious are determining your action. You think you're in charge, but something else is in charge. And then you talked about Derrida. 
I mean, you didn't mention Derrida, but I guess you mentioned the phenomenologist. You mentioned, but Derrida is also uh, talking about the impossibility, in fact, of any signification. He started uh, with this uh, sign and signify, which in Sanskrit is always united, isn't it? Vagar, uh, as Kalidasa said, but. He's saying the signified is always different. So you can never know what anything means because it's a play of different, difference and difference. But it results in the erosion of the sovereign subject. Then you have Foucault, once again, who says we are a product of all these institutional uh, devices. You know, the when he talks about uh, the hospital and, uh, you know, uh, social engineering, and he talks about uh, bioethics and biopolitics. So the state and all its institutions and many other institutions actually control our behavior. That is what is being suggested. So once again, the idea of the sovereign subject, which is the basis of capitalism in a way, yes. is being eroded. So where are we now? We are at a transhuman moment. This is the point I was trying to make. And in the, at Philosophically, humanism, which was the post-Renaissance idea of the West, of the sovereign subject, capitalism as individuals, driving progress, all of this has now come to an inflection point, so, so much so, that the uniqueness of the human is being undermined by AI. In fact, AI can produce better essays than most papers that we have presented. And I'll tell you, Swamiji, for teachers, it's going to be a problem. Yeah. You cannot give an assignment because AI will generate an answer for you. In fact, I don't have time to demonstrate it, but my very paper has two or three AI-generated answers. You know, I was going to read them out, but there's absolutely no time, and I don't want to tax your patience. Everybody's exhausted. And in fact, you heard you were saying we need an energy boost to listen to you now. Because, the, you know, it is very intense, I agree. And, uh, but we are academics. We must have the stamina to pursue the life of the mind. But what I'm trying to suggest, Swamiji, is we are coming, we are at the cusp of another type of crisis where the future of higher education is really in a state of, I would say, uncertainty. Because critical thinking, deep cognition, and fake cognition, there's going to be it's going to be impossible to distinguish between fake cognition and deep cognition. And our entire tradition is based on deep cognition, as it were. So these, I think, are some of the directions to pursue when we take our discussion forward, right? And we must engage with the West, but I think this is the moment to show. Western traditions, that we have certain resources that can actually save them from the impasse, the euphoria, the dead ends that they have arrived at, and the disintegration, as it were, of the social fabric that we see in the West. You know, the disintegration of normative behavior, uh, so much so that if you go to uh, cities like uh, San Francisco, there is no police. And uh, as soon as, uh, you know, somebody starts approaching a shop, they, they shut down the shutters and they put away all the things because people just come and take what they want and leave. And you can't prosecute them. Okay. So this thing such as Black Lives Matter and so forth has resulted in such a, should I say, uh, reaction to the other extreme that a lot of petty crimes cannot even be prosecuted now. You know, so there's a disintegration at a level that is almost unimaginable. Whereas in a society like ours, you know, uh, there is a natural, I would say, injunction against doing wrong things. Otherwise, the poor would have been stealing from the rich. But we don't see that. People are safe in our cities. They wander around. Except for liquor shops, you don't see bars on any store. <laughs> People go, you know, you'll be paid. So this, is, press clubs. so this is so this is yeah so that's that's how you can buy a journalist in India one bottle of scotch is enough you know, <laughs> unfortunately with due respect to the 
present exception to the rule. <laughs> we are not talking about you, so I, uh, forgive me if I said something that hurts you. So anyhow, now uh, I want to conclude, and uh, I want to I want to conclude by going uh, to science now, because uh, uh, Swamiji, we have been saying uh, you know in Indian tradition in the Vichara Mark what. Ramana Maharshi also said that uh, when you say, who am I? If you ask that question and you take it to its logical conclusion, which has actually happened in my own case when I was 21 years old, the process of self-inquiry was very liberating for me because it took me to a point where I arrived at this very, uh, should I say, uh, painful juncture where I felt that, uh, okay, I've learned a few things, I've understood a few things, but who is it that has understood and learned these things? You know, the learning of the experience is only as true as the experiencer. And so it's all false, you know, and the escape from this, as it were, prison, prison house of the mind, was simply the very liberative experience, which is not to be captured only in words, is that there's no such entity as Makra. So in a sense, it's Anatmava. There's no such entity. So be fully relaxed. <laughs> so there's nothing that is, is going to attach because there's no center of gravity to which everything attaches and then from which there is no freedom. Because even freedom can only be as as true as the person experiencing freedom and so forth. And so that is a state where there's neither subject nor object. But that experience of oneness, I think, uh, which is, that is the Anubhava, which is the basis of Vedanta, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that uh, Vichar Mar and uh, this process that we've all uh, embarked on together can actually save us from so much suffering. It can save us from the fear of death, it can save us from uh, the fear of uh, punar janma and also the, the fear that we will lose our knowledge, we will lose uh, whatever we have earned and have to go back to the nursery school in our next birth. And the fear that as our organs fail us, as we age, you know, we will get unbundled and our self will get scattered and we will lose our essence. So all these fears, we are free from these fears. And if you observe a child, you will see that embodiment is happening before our eyes. They don't even know who they are. And only after a few months, if you say, where are you? who is Malini, then she'll say this. She doesn't even know at the beginning who she is. So the self, other distinction doesn't even exist, right? And they don't know for a very long time that they are somebody separate from the mother. You know, they're breastfeeding. They don't know for a very long time. So it takes a while for embodiment and ahankara to emerge. And similarly, the unbundling also has to happen. The senses will fail. But the fear of all this, the fear of process, vanishes. So we know that the self is not an entity through Advaita Vedanta. And perhaps the phenomenologists are telling us that the self is not an entity. The self is a process. But science, Swamiji, is now telling us that the self is not just not an entity, it is not even a species, because there are more non-human cells in my body than human cells. My microbiome, my gut is full of bacteria, viruses, and without them, I can't exist. In fact, my feelings, according to science, are largely determined by the bacteria in my gut. You know, because these bacteria are sending signals of happiness, unhappiness, anxiety, satiety, you know, uh, even schizophrenia, much of it is being driven by the bacteria in your gut. And these bacteria, through antibiotics, through the isolation of the human species from the other species, the way we have divorced ourselves from nature. So this, uh, this you might say, uh, this pool, this swamp of bacteria 
is reducing and we are getting towards becoming monocultural. So, in a sense, our existence, even as a species, is threatened. This is, this is what I'm saying. And it is, I think, our traditions of Arshavadya, Sanatana Dharma, which can realign us as the Vedas have taught us right from the beginning. They can realign us with both nature and supernature so that the species as well as the, well as the planet can stop hurtling towards suicide and self-destruction. Because that is the path we have embarked upon. In fact, all modern biomedicine is based on isolating cells in petri dishes and using or trying to find that molecule which will act on that cell to cure that particular disease. But no cell exists in isolation with any other cell. No human being can exist in isolation from any other human being or any other form of life or even material non-living entities like the air we breathe. We talked about ghatakash. This itself is a ghata. So once I breathe out the air, part of my air that has been breathed out, you are breathing. And I'm breathing in your air. So to think that you and I are separate is a complete illusion. Because we are all not only interdependent and interconnected, but at the cellular and molecular level, it's a soup, you know, without any demarcation. There's no way to demarcate where I end and this podium begins. It's impossible in science at the quantum level to draw a boundary. So I think Advaita is being proven in ways that we have not imagined. It is being proven that there is no isolated entity. When we say Isa Vasyam Nidam Sarvam, it is actually a fact that we are all energy beings and the energy is permeating the entire cosmos. There are no boundaries of a rigid and fixed type. And that's why Ahamkar can only be at most a matter of convenience. So I think that I think that uh, uh, the self is not an entity. The species is also, uh, uh, in that sense, the human species is also, I mean, the self is not an entity, but the, the self is not even a species because our species, human, homo sapiens, whatever you want to call them, they are completely interdependent and interconnected with all other species. And therefore, the conclusion, and here uh, I just want to bring in uh, Inova Bhavi for just a moment because he gives a, a wonderfully different interpretation to the Gita uh, in his theory of, uh, of karma, vikarma, and akarma. Uh, and uh, I mentioned that last, uh, I think yesterday in a question, but uh, I think it's important to talk about the Gita as a conclusion for the very simple reason that the Gita has become the defining book of the Indian national struggle for independence. You know, from, uh, you know, from Tilak, okay, Tilak. Go, everyone, Gandhi. Gandhi, Vinoba, Sri Aurobindo, essays on the Gita, the number of commentaries, and then Swami Chinmayananda, there are so many, we can't even count them. Why? What happened? So, in a way, we don't want to be critical, historical, and get trapped in that Western mode, the historical critical mode, because we, we don't belong to history. We are really Akalis, you know. We are, we are a self-centric civilization which denies the tyranny of time. So, we are archetypal. We continue our yajna whenever and wherever the situation is conducive. So, we replicate the conditions which were at the start of the cosmos, right? So we are not trapped in history and we are forever free of time, you know, uh, and we worship time, Mahakala, and that is the freedom we enjoy as Sanatanis, I feel. So, but for the time being, talking about the historical critical method, which tyrannized us from Max Muller onwards, the philological, the historical, the critical, and trapped in that, modern Indian academics has been, you know, gasping for breath, Swamiji. But for a moment, see the shift from Prasthana Prayer, where the Gita is elevated to 
be a source of knowledge, that knowledge which can lead to liberation, to bhakti, with, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, becomes an ancillary text to Bhagavad Puran, and then uh, the whole bhakti movement as a way to save Sanatana Dharma, you know, only because you're so helpless, you have no arms, you don't even have knowledge because all the Patshalas are finished, all the schools have been destroyed. So between Naneshwar and Tukaram, what happened in Maharashtra? You know, all the centers of knowledge were destroyed, including Paitan, you know, which was Eknath Maharaj's place. So then what do you have? You still have Anubhava. That's why I started with Tukaram. Nobody can take that from you. You can steal your language. You can steal your institutions. Your Vedas may be scattered. The Pothis may be burned. Nalanda was burned and it burned for months. But who can steal your Anubhava, right? And who can steal your devotion? So we survived with devotion and the devotion to Sri Krishna saved the civilization. And the Mahamantra was given. And instead of Rama and Krishna fighting, they included both Rama and Krishna. So that so both Tulsidas and Chaitanya can, can go in the same stream. But then what happened when the British colonized us? With Bankim, we started shifting from both a text of knowledge regarding Gita to a, as a text of knowledge, then to a text of devotion. So Bankim says all this bhakti and blowing the conch and the beating of the drums and you know dancing in ecstasy is not going to help us. You have to do karma. We have to bring Krishna as the master of karma back to the center of the national consciousness. Bankim starts that. Then Tilak, everybody follows that. And today we have this conference on Karya and Akari. So I want to end with, with, uh, with what Vinoba said. And so he says that normally the karma is defined as that which, which should not be done. You know, and uh, karma is defined as that which should be done. But he says no. He says that karma is that which will bind us. Vikarma is that which we should do in such a way that it cuts the bondage of karma. The end result is a karma or anasakti yoga. So he gives the definition of anasakti yoga, which Gandhiji talks about anasakti yoga in his commentary on the Gita. And uh, it is one of the very radical way of looking at the Gita. I think so. So I think that. Like, uh, he says that uh, karma, he defines it as a nice karma. That's right. And uh, therefore, karma has a place. I wanted to speak about that term your time. Karma and vikarma makes a karma. That's right. That's what so, I'm saying. The combination. Uh, so, so now let's end this. I'll end my own valedictory now. So, karma is inevitable. Then, how do you free yourself from karma? So, again, the tradition gives you all these. Option. One is you surrender. You say Krishna for yeah. right? You surrender, you're free. The other is you do Nishkama Karma. Right? So you, you say Karma Nevadikaraste Mafade Shukadachan. Now most people say renounce the fruit of action. I don't say that. I think what Bhagavan is saying is action or all the things that you do in order to achieve a particular goal are in your control. The effort is yours. You can put in as much effort as you can. But the outcome is not in your hands. As they say in the West, man proposes God before this. So what Krishna is saying, what Bhagavan is saying, why worry about the outcome? It's not in your hands. It will make you terribly unhappy. So when he says you don't have adhikar on the outcome, what he's saying is the causation or correlation between the effort as the cause and the fruit as the outcome is so mysterious in a world of infinite causality that to be free, you forget about the outcome, but keep putting in your best. So that's another way to be free, that you do your effort and don't worry about the result. Then the third way, I mean, you do this, you do low kalyan, you have nothing to gain, you just keep serving other people. There's a wonderful, you know, story of, uh, of, of uh, you know, Ramana Maharishi, there's a shepherd boy, you know, who wanted his cane. So he goes on the Girivallam 
and on the path he takes a, a branch then he strips it he smoothens it with some leaves and when he comes back from the girivardam he has the stick for the shepherd boy that hears your stick so that is also a kind of karma yoga he's demonstrating a gyani is demonstrating how to act in the world so i feel that uh, we have had this privilege of coming uh, to this wonderful place this ashram uh, you have given us hospitality swami ji and guidance i'm deeply grateful to you we all want to join your yagya so that we take this forward and uh, in our traditions you know we move towards the the right action which is so important the kartavya to build this country and as as we all know as uh, shorobindo said india rises not for herself she rises for all she rises for humanity so i think the time has come for us to shed this knowledge of bharata in the prabhasa uh, and the knowledge of our uh, traditions which can liberate us all of us it's for everybody it's not sectarian everyone knows that sanatana dharma is not sectarian it's absolutely for everyone it's an invitation so under your guidance i hope that we can take the series of conferences forward to different parts of india maybe abroad and uh, and act like uh, true karma yogis as uh, uh, sadguru ma taught us thank you thank you